So um, I will just going. I will be going back to the basics, and we will start with the definitions, applied anatomy, um, the risk factors, preventative measures that we can take to prevent prolapse, um, symptoms, um, clinical examinations and signs, the staging. Uh, then appropriate investigations, and then obviously the management. So pelvic organ prolapse is the herniation of one or more pelvic organs to or beyond the vaginal walls. Um, and this definition is accepted by the International Urogynecological Association and the International Continent Society. And since 2010, they've changed the terminology according to the sites of prolapse. So the sites of prolapse can obviously be in the anterior compartment, which is herniation of the anterior wall associated with the descent of the bladder and or urethra. And this, uh, the old term for this was urethra and cystocele. Then you get the apical compartment prolapse, um, which is the descent of the vaginal apex into the lower vagina to the hymen or behind the introitus. Um, and then the apex can be the uterus with a cervix, only the uterus or the vaginal vault if the patient has had a hysterectomy before. Then posterior compartment prolapse is herniation of the posterior wall with or without herniation of the small bowel or rectum. And the old term for this, um, terms for this were recta and introceal. Uh, rectal prolapse and perennial body defect also fall <coughs> under this category. And then the herniation of all three compartments, as we know, is then called precedentia. So this is just a basic illustration of the sites of prolapse, where A is the anterior compartment prolapse, B posterior compartment, and then C and D the apical compartment, with C being uterine prolapse, and then D the vault prolapse after hysterectomy. So to go back to um, the anatomy, and to help us to understand the cause and risk factors of prolapse, Delancey described three layers of pelvic support. So layer one is the uterosacral ligaments and the transverse cervical ligaments. Layer two is the endopelvic fascia. And layer three is the levator only muscle and the perineal body. So here you can see a three-dimensional illustration of the three layers of support. And they obviously work together. So level one is the uterosacral and the cardinal, cardinal ligament complex there. Level two is the endopelvic fascia, anteriorly stretching to the arcus tendineus fascia and posteriorly to the arcus tendineus recta vaginalis. And then level three is the pelvic floor muscles, as mentioned before, providing support like a hanging basket. So the three layers work together to keep the pelvic organs in place. Um, an interesting analogy that is used to describe the mechanism of prolapse is the boat in a dry dock theory, where the ship is the pelvic organs, the, rope are the, ligament, the ropes are the ligaments and fascia, and the water is the pelvic floor muscles. If the water is reduced, meaning the pelvic floor muscles become weakened, weakened the boat obviously hangs on the rope uh, or ropes, and eventually they will stretch out and break, resulting in the boat or then the organs falling down or prolapsing. And falling will obviously happen quicker if you jump on the boat, which in, for instance could be an increase in uh, intra-abdominal pressure. So when we get to the risk factors, the first one is parity. So pregnancy apart from normal vaginal delivery, contributes to prolapse. Um, in the Oxford Family Planning Study, there was a pros which was a prospective cohort um, study of more than 17,000 women, which were followed up for 17 years. They compared with nulliparity, and it saw that there was an increased risk in hospital admission for prolapse after the first and second birth of fourfold and eightfold, respectively as well as an increase in risk of the ninefold and tenfold for the third and fourth pregnancy. And then childbirth related factors like pelvic floor injury due to compression, stretching and tearing of the nerve, muscle and connective tissue obviously also play a role. And evidence shows that high infant birth weight, a prolonged second stage of labor and a maternal age of less than 25 years at first delivery is also um, risk factors. Then the next factor is advancing age. Epidemiological studies have reported an increase of risk of prolapse with advancing age. Um, in the pelvic organ support study, which was a multi-center st uh, observational study of over a thousand women presenting for routine gynecologic examination, they reported a progressive increase in the rate of prolapse with increasing age. And there was a 40% increased risk of prolapse for every additional 10 years of age. 
And in the Women's Health Initiative trial, there was a small but statistically significant progressive increase in the prevalence of posterior compartment prolapse with age. The next risk factor is high BMI. There is an increased risk, risk for prolapse when compared with the normal weight peers. This was found in a meta-analysis of 22 studies reporting the effect of weight on the risk of prolapse. And then overweight, overweight and obese women had a nearly 40 to 50 percent increased risk of prolapse. So the risk ratio was 1.36 for overweight females and risk ratio of 1.47 for obese. It is controversial whether weight loss results in prolapse regression. This, a study of 16,000 postmenopausal women found no association with weight loss and regression of prolapse. However, there are reports of <coughs> prolapse regression in women after bariatric surgery. The next possible risk factor is previous hysterectomy, but this is controversial as the risk may depend on the age, as we discussed now, whether the prolapse was the indication or present at the time of the hysterectomy, and on the surgical approach, approach including apical support procedures at the, history, uh, at the surgery. So to zoom into the evidence of A, whether prolapse was the indication of the hysterectomy to start off with, there is shown to be an increased risk for future, future prolapse when hysterectomy is performed <laughs> for the indication of prolapse. And the risk of future prolapse in women with normal pelvic support is less clear. In a retrospective review of 2,600 women who underwent vaginal hysterectomies or abdominal hysterectomies for benign indication at a single institution were followed up for a 13-year period. And then they saw that the incident of subsequent vaginal vault prolapse was 12% when the hysterectomy was performed for the indication of prolapse versus nearly 2% when the hysterectomy was performed for other indications. However, information on apical support procedures at the time of these hysterectomies were not available and the surgeries were performed between 1983 and 1987, which may have impacted the outcomes as guidelines requiring apical suspension at the time of hysterectomy for prolapse were not in place in that area of the U.S. until 2015. So the next factor to look at is whether the root of the hysterectomy affects the risk. So vaginal versus abdominal root. The impact of vaginal hysterectomy on the risk of future prolapse is unclear because the choice of surgical route is determined by the presence of the underlying prolapse, which, we, as we said, appears to be a major risk for subsequent prolapse. In the Danish nationwide cohort study, which included over 178,000 women undergoing hysterectomy for benign indication over a 40-year period, showed that when correcting for prolapse at the time of hysterectomy, the risk of prolapse only slightly increased for the vaginal root compared with the abdominal root. And then, with regards to laparoscopy, the incidence of prolapse after laparoscopic root is, un is less clear. Evidence from a large cohort study reported no additional risk in prolapse with the laparoscopic um, root versus the abdominal root. But the concern remains for some, that electrosurgical devices are being used which may not allow for incorporation of the uterosacral complex into the cuff closure. The last factor is, oh no, sorry, the last one is whether the apical suspension affects your risk. So evidence suggests that patients undergoing hysterectomy for uterine prolapse often did not have apical suspension performed routinely, which likely contributed to the high rate of recurrent prolapse following hysterectomy. In a retrospective review of the Michigan Surgically, Surgical Quality Collaborative, including over 1,500 women who underwent hysterectomy for uterine prolapse, reported that only 24% had an apical support procedure done. And subsequently, the National Quality Forum selected vaginal apical suspension at the time of hysterectomy to address pelvic organ prolapse as a prolapse quality indicator for, the, for all U.S. hospitals since 2015. So, it is plausible to allocate prolapse recurrence due to the persistence of the obvious underlying cause, like injury, previous injury or connective tissue disorders. But it is unclear if the underlying prolapse or the surgical approach confers the greater recurrence risk of the prolapse. The next risk factor is race. There is conflicting data on the prevalence of prolapse amongst different races. And then familial history, there is evidence. A systematic review of 16 studies found a 2.5-fold increased risk of prolapse in women with a family history. But no clear evidence on the exact, exact genetic component is available. And lastly, factors like chronically raised intra-abdominal pressure, chronic constipation, COPD, has been identified as risk factors. Heavy lifting, 
data conflicts re regarding whether the risk of prolapse is increased in women with occupations that involve heavy lifting. And lastly, co collagen abnormalities. So connective tissue disorders like Ehlers Danlos syndrome or congenital abnormalities like bladder extrophy can contribute to prolapse. And women with hypermobile joints have a higher prevalence of prolapse than women with normal joint mobility. <laughs> So if we know the risk factors, we can obviously attempt to prevent prolapse. With healthy lifestyle of exercise, healthy diet and maintaining a normal weight, good obstetrical practice, so avoidance of prolonged of second stage of labor, avoidance of elective forceps delivery, and also the selective use of episiotomy, as it does not prevent urinary incontinence or prolapse and may increase the risk of fecal incontinence. And then other preventative measures could be the treatment of your chronic constipation, suppression of chronic cough, avoidance of job, jobs that require heavy lifting, but this needs more <coughs> evidence. And then the fact of estrogens um, is that there's no data currently supporting estrogen for the primary prevention or treatment for prolapse. This was found in a systematic review of six randomized trials that evaluated the effects of estrogens or serms for the prevention of prolapse. So common symptoms of prolapse is related to the prolapse structures and the severity of some symptoms does not correlate with the stage. Symptoms um, can often be related to the patient's position and many patients are asymptomatic and does not need any treatment. Therefore, screening for symptoms are important. The main categories for symptoms are the bulge or pressure symptoms. The woman may, might feel that there's a feeling of heaviness in the pelvis or vagina or that something is bulging or falling out. Then urinary symptoms include stress, urinary incontinence, frequency, urgency and abnormal emptying like straining and, or incomplete bladder emptying. The most common defecatory symptoms include constipation and incomplete emptying and other symptoms include fecal urgency, incontinence and obstructive symptoms like straining or the need to digitally evacuate feces. And then patients with prolapse often present with sexual dysfunction as a result of dyspareunia, um, a fear of the discomfort or embarrassment, especially if incontinence during intercourse is present. And then other symptoms that can be present, although it's not consistent with prolapse, is lower back pain and pelvic pain. So your clinical examination, you should obviously start with a visual inspection. Um, it should be while the patient is relaxed and while the patient is straining. Um, you should look at the transverse diameter of the genital hiatus. You should look at protrusion of any tissue to or beyond the introitus or procedentia. You should look at the length and the condition of the perineum and then look for ulceration if prolapse is beyond the introitus. Then you do your speculum. It is advised that the patient um, is in dorsal lithotomy and also while the patient is relaxed and when straining. Then you look for apical prolapse with a bivalve or cusco speculum. Um, we insert it and slowly withdraw and look at the apex if there's any descent. And then anterior compartment, you use your Sims retracted to insert into the vagina with gentle pressure on the posterior wall to isolate visualization of the anterior wall. And for the posterior compartment, the other way around. So a biomanual exam is obviously then done to detect any other pelvic disorders. And very important is a rectal vaginal exam. This is done with the aims to diagnose any prolapse in the posterior compartment to insist the integrity of the perennial body and to detect obvious rectal prolapse. Then the <coughs> technique for diagnosing a high posterior, posterior compartment prolapse or an intra seal is done with the patient usually in standing position where you will small bowel will be detected with the thumb and the index finger herniating into the pouch of Douglas. Then your, to complete your assessment, a gross neurological assessment should be made of nerves L4 to S5 the motor and sensory functions and sacral reflexes could be tested if there is suspicion for neurological pathology which also warrants a neuro neurologist referral obviously. The reflexes include the clitoral and anal sphincter reflexes and lastly pelvic floor muscle testing should be tested by asking the patient to contract the pelvic floor around the examiner's fingers as this could guide your management. So to get to the staging um, we all know of the pelvic organ prolapse quantification system, POPQ system. This is the most commonly used prolapse system. It's advised by the Society of Gynecological Surgeons, the American Urogynecological Society and the International Continence Society. And the remnants of the hymen is an important landmark. 
So the topography is, used, is described using six points in a three by three grid, as you can see there. So two is on the anterior vaginal wall there, which will be AA and BA. Two on the apex of the vagina, which is C and D. And then two on the posterior vaginal wall, which is in your AP and BP. And with the total vaginal length, the genital hiatus length, and the perennial body length, they form a sagittal diagram of the prolapse. So this is a practical example of the POPQ system used to schematically illustrate the prolapse. In this picture, the actual measurements are described in the 3x3 three three grid, and using them, this illustrates a posterior compartment prolapse. The POPQ system um, has been described as described the staging of the prolapse from 0 to 4, where 0 is no prolapse, and then 4 is complete prosodentia. Where, and then the middle would be 2, where it is 1 centimeter, 1 centimeter below or above the remnants of the hymen. So appropriate investigations. Obviously, a urine for culture and sensitivity to rule out a, a uter urinary tract infection. Perennial ultrasound can be done to identify the muscle defects or prolapse of the different organs. Urodynamic studies um, are advised only to be done in women with complicated stress urinary incontinence. Um, and then interestingly, 13 to 65% of continent women develop stress urinary incontinence symptoms after surgical correction of prolapse. This is referred to as occult stress urinary incontinence and this needs to be screened to prior surgery if you are planning a one-step procedure. Then a post-voidal residual urine volume can be done if there's urinary retention. And then defecography may demonstrate an intraseal that was not detected on the POPQ or, um, and it is indicated for anal incompeten incompetence or severe fecal obstructive symptoms. And then dynamic MRI is under investigation but only used for research purposes at this stage. So management, obviously expectant, conservative and surgically. Both conservative and surgical treatment options should be offered as there is no high quality data comparing these two approaches directly. The choice depends on, upon the patient's preferences, the ability to comply with a the conservative therapy or to tolerate surgery. So expectant management is a viable option if the symptoms are tolerable and it is the patient's preference. But the patient should be evaluated on a regular basis to assess for the development or worsening of symptoms and or findings. Then conservative treatment is the first line option. Uh, vaginal pessaries is the main are the mainstay of conservative treatment. They are silicon devices in a variety of shapes and sizes and physically provide support to the pelvic organs, but they need ongoing maintenance and inspection and must be removed and cleaned on a regular basis. Then pelvic floor muscle training, there's good evidence to show improvement in the prolapse stage and symptoms. This was found in a meta-analysis um, of over 2,300 women. And then there is no evidence of estrogens as a primary treatment for prolapse. Next up is surgery. Um, it's for symptomatic patients who failed or declined conservative management, obviously. And the factors to be considered are, are you going to do reconstructive or obliterative procedures? Um, so reconstructive obliterative procedures can be done. So obliterative procedures are reserved for women who cannot tolerate extension of surgery and are not planning future vaginal intercourse where reconstructive surgery corrects the prolapse surgically. And then you need to decide, are you also going to do a hysterectomy? Are you also going to correct the anti-incontinence or the incontinence with an anti-incontinence procedure? And are you going to use surgical mesh? And then the options of surgical procedures include these ones for the different anatomic sites, which Dr. Jansen van Rensburg will tell you more about. So the bottom line is that pelvic organ prolapse significantly affects your patient's quality of life and can and needs to be addressed. Thank you.
protect them because yes. if you do a lot of lifting, they will be the proper yes. pelvic floor. So I think um, people should be. I think if it's done appropriately, or well, if it's done yeah. appropriately, I, yeah. I, yeah. I suppose you know. I agree. It was very good, thank you, Smith, and uh, what was the good evening. Uh, I just want to know in terms of cesarean section, is anything going on with cesarean section? Did you uh, I didn't find anything related to cesarean section? Oh. I didn't find any evidence. Um, I don't know. Logical reason. Um, do you think when you're going to have elective cesarean section, it will protect the pelvic floor? No, because. I think logically, as I said, it, just parity itself, being pregnant already increases your risk for prolapse. So I think to put somebody through, I think it should rather be a good obstetrical practice um, should be implemented instead of saying I'm just going for elective Caesar. That's what I would say. Yeah, I think you must be careful in saying that because it will be protective to a certain extent and it has been yeah. shown. But you have to weigh that benefits and yeah. risks versus vaginal delivery versus uh, a cesarean section. And, and the cesarean sections they're talking about, elective versus emergency. Those, it, there's different, there yeah. is subtle differences around this. But I think in, in a short summary, the, if you weigh the, the benefits and the risks of protecting the pelvic floor versus the complications you can get for the cesarean section, there's consensus still that you should uh, do uh, aim for vaginal delivery. But it's interesting that uh, the it, it, traditionally it was like this: the, the 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 populations that want a cesarean section on request are two. Um, <coughs> there are two um, professions involved. It's the lawyers. And it is the, the doctors, female doctors. They, they are the most common professional people <coughs> requesting elective cesarean section. But the correct answer is, and it's actually a topic for its own. And uh, I remember Professor Tron and uh, Professor Wall was here when we had Magnus Murphy from uh, Canada who did some work on that, so presenting that day, and it uh, had quite a bit of delay. Yeah, on, on the that's the first point I was making. Because Edward's illustration was in logic, a simple argument that was very easy to follow. But the judgment was a good example of a complex argument. So complex arguments are separate, simple arguments with a lot of sub-confusions. And it's actually possible to have a logical argument with an incorrect confusion if your science is wrong. Um, so it is actually possible to get there. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I also enjoyed it. I, I think I'll you speak twice now. I'll, I'll just say speak a little bit slower because okay. you don't do yourself justice in that sense. Okay. <laughs> um, I like the formulation of your slides. They're they, 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 they good. Um, my curve more question to you is in the light of the current mesh problems, will we be using mesh in five years' time? Or not? Well, I don't know because. Um, the FDA just recently, just now in the last two months, uh, released another document that some of the latest uh, intravaginal measures uh, has been withdrawn from the market. So uh, if we talk about mesh intravaginally with vaginal procedures, uh, unlikely that we're going to see it now. Um, the complications are the, are the, are the issue and uh, Countries have abandoned it now, so I feel from the Regis Cross point of view, they must know about this, and this has been abandoned. So I think intravaginal mesh. In terms of the incontinence for your counseling, that the yeah. is where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. And litigation. Litigation is, is one of the biggest things. Counseling thing. ethics first, litigation second. Yeah. <laughs> but litigation uh, has, uh, has uh, spiraled in, 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 uh, in the world and very, very huge amount of money to be paid and it was cheaper for the companies actually to pull out. In terms of the incontinent surgery for the polypropylene mesh, uh, it's still recognized as the first line therapy, but there's even now countries who, uh, the first was copied, uh, but there are countries now that uh, are abandoned. 
But for the sacral carpal pexia, and that is a little bit of a concern to me on a personal level, is that <coughs> the sacral carpal pexia was used to be a procedure in the, in the last line, and, and that mesh has not been abandoned. So I think we're going to see more and more sacral carpal pexia being done. And we're always concerned because it's a major procedure to do a sacral carpal pexia with mesh complications. So time will, will learn. But intraabdominal mesh, just something interesting maybe to tell you that uh, in terms of there's always evolution in sciences and we want to try different products so if you look at the absorbable meshes there's now getting materials that will absorb only over a period of two years and there's now trials ongoing to see uh, isn't that an option you know where it stays longer where you can develop uh, in-growth of uh, fibroblasts and so on to give that kind of a support with the scar tissue, but uh, then it will be absorbed by the body and it's not permanent. 